Yes, I think, I hope we are being recorded properly. Can you edit this? I think I can edit it later. Max, we are now assembled here, two of us, to discuss a very important subject, the significance of St. Augustine's Confessions. Very exciting. I hold that all the great classics elude us and are never properly studied. I can't really think of any book on St. Augustine or on St. Augustine's Confessions that does justice to this very dense work and its multiple dimensions. We've been discussing it a little bit among ourselves for the last few weeks. And what is your impression of this work? What is it? Is it a, what, how would you describe St. Augustine's Confessions? Well, you saw it. I can only talk from the position of a, a student since I've been learning at the feet of a master. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've never read the confessions before. So mm-hmm. these are all mm-hmm. first impressions. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, as someone who doesn't know that much about Christian theology mm-hmm. or the history of the early church, mm-hmm. uh, one of my first impressions is that uh, Augustine has a very... Um, he has a, an interesting relationship to scripture, it seems like. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know scripture that well, but mm-hmm. um, reading through my copy, there's constantly little notes mm-hmm. next to the main body of the confession where mm-hmm. uh, the translator is indicating, okay, this is a, a citation or, or a paraphrase mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that struck me that this is, this is a guy who's really steeped in certain parts of Scripture is mm-hmm. constantly going back to mm-hmm. those touchstones, and the certain parts will be in this in this particular work, the Psalms, and Saint Paul, and the Psalms are deliberately used right through the work. They, they set the tone of the whole work. I mean, Augustine is talking to God, so he uses the language of the Psalms, which is the if you want a canonic if you want a canonical language for talking to God, you can't do better than the Psalms. Um, so that gives a kind of framework to this whole experiment. Remember, this is, oh my goodness, there's an earthquake. We've been caught on camera in a dramatic moment. Anyway, <laughs> You're crushed into all your books, Joe. <laughs> well, this, this will be quite, it, a, it's, quite a video. It's still going on, it's still going on. Just a little bit. Oh, well, um, I don't think so. I think it's quite serious. Hmm. Anyway, St. Augustine. Um, you better not make any good points, Joe, otherwise the the Earth's going to respond. He was doing doing an experiment in this work because it's addressed to God. I mean, his other works are about God, perhaps, but this is addressed to God. And remember the opening pages where he's really puzzled about who is God. I mean, this is the question he's asking. There's a heap of questions, one piled on the other. He's basically trying to orient himself in regard to God, which is a big right. deal, a big, yeah. big challenge. Um, so, the, the of course, Scripture gives a, a firm framework, the Psalms do, and, and St. Paul plays a big role, especially because St. Paul is so instrumental in Augustine's conversion. I mean, it, the, the whole thing hinges around the famous scene where a voice says, Tole lege. If, uh, take and read, and he reads a few lines of Paul, and suddenly his shackles fall away, and divine grace releases him into complete spiritual and moral freedom. Something he has sought earlier from reading Plotinus, Platonists, and to me that is a very fascinating thing because Augustine is trying to come to terms with God, and he 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 has a lot of problems with. Manichaeanism especially has poisoned his mind and he thinks of God in all sorts of wrong ways. And then he reads Plotinus and he's enlightened. He says, suddenly he has an illumination. I mean, he suddenly sees everything correctly. He sees himself, he sees the world, he sees God, and he sees them all in a totally harmonious context. It's kind of a mystical moment. And he tries to recapture that without much success. And he also realizes that this is not enough because human beings are too weak to grasp after God. They need the incarnation. They need uh, the, the signs of Christ to guide them on the path of faith right. to, to a more stable vision. Mm. 
Yeah, and so it's it's interesting in this work the way Augustine's constantly weaving um, he's weaving his, his life story or the story of his religious life at least yeah. in with often very abstruse metaphysical mm -hmm. discussions mm -hmm. and you know the the first time I I read any of this material mm -hmm. uh, I was constantly getting thrown on the back foot because we'd start with something that seemed straightforward like a discussion of um, Augustine's infancy or something like this mm -hmm. and then suddenly it's kind of imperceptibly he switches from this mode of talking about what it's like to be an infant mm -hmm. to talking about mm -hmm. the nature of memory mm -hmm. and um, what the ontological status of sin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? so I mean you and it, it starts at the very beginning um, you know after that sort of process was kind of thrown in my face in these interesting discussions about infancy I went back and read the, the very beginning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you see the same process starting right away you know so I think let's see we just go to the very first page of Augusta mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we start with this invocation of the Psalms where he says Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and thy wisdom is infinite. Okay. And then he goes on to discuss how he feels like he wants to praise God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he's setting up the whole Confessions as mm -hmm. a sort of song in which mm -hmm. he praises God. Mm -hmm. But he just can't resist turning towards the intellectual and the metaphysical. So mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a few sentences sentences later let's mm -hmm. see here um so he says grant me lord then to know and understand what i ought first to do whether to call upon thee or to praise thee okay you know, i was reading that and saying it didn't strike me as different necessarily i wouldn't mm -hmm. have wanted mm -hmm. to draw this fine distinction but mm -hmm. i guess augustine is a mm -hmm. rhetorician so he's used to to going into these kind of fine mm -hmm. points right mm -hmm. and then he continues which ought to be first, to know thee or to call upon thee? But who can rightly call upon thee that is yet ignorant of thee? Mm -hmm. So instantaneously, this is the this is the first page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're already yeah. basically in, in in epistemological discussion. And, and that's right. And yes. It, it's a questioning. Um but you're right that the, the, the greatness of this book is it combines different layers. You have the, the the lived experience, the life story, which he does manage to tell quite a lot of. And then you have the religious dimension with the Psalms commenting on it. And then you have the philosophical dimension, where at first it looks very amateurish. Like he says, how can I know you if I, how can I praise you if I don't know you? This looks like a very homemade kind of philosophy. But the more you read it, the more you realize that it's a highly sophisticated book, purely as philosophy. I mean, he discovers Plotinus in Book 7. But in a way, Plotinus is pervading the whole text because the very idea that the, the very way he talks about God is based on, on Plotinus' idea of the one. The one is not up there in outer space. The one is here. It's the center. The mm -hmm. one is the center, according to Plotinus. And it's nearer to us than we are to ourselves. And this is exactly what Augustine says about God. So you see the, the three dimensions... And you're right that the episodes he chooses from his life, most of them have a universal character. They're every man. They're anthropological they're, and they're existential. So he's the first existentialist in that sense, that he, he analyzes human experience with a view to its universal or um, you know, ontological patterns. Right, yeah. And... Uh... Again, I mean, not to harp on the first, you know, the very first page, but mm -hmm. uh, it strikes me that he kind of he kind of sets up the two main subjects right away. One is God, and then the other is myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's, he kept, mm -hmm. he he says over and over again in this in this first section, mm -hmm. "How do I know thee? Mm -hmm. How do I praise thee?" Mm -hmm. Right. So we have three things in mm -hmm. each of these sentences. Mm -hmm. I, some relation, and then God, mm -hmm. D. Mm -hmm. So, um, he, 
right off the bat, I think signals the two main interests of the work. And then mm -hmm. um, the interesting, really interesting thing to me is that uh, he's suggesting that it's very difficult ultimately to disentangle uh, I and D, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the individual and God. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that one of the main tools with which he explores the way these two things interrelate is his discussions of memory, mm -hmm. right? Because... Um, could, I, could I interrupt you there? Sure, because yeah. Memory, you're going to launch on a vast discussion there. I want to say something about what you just said. It's very true. The, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self go together. Pari passu, you know, they're on the same, they're, 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 they're on the same track. And of course, when he reads Plotinus, he says, I entered into my own intimacy and I was able to, by grace, you know, the, Augustine always brings in grace, because you were my, my guide, again, quoting the Bible. So he discovers himself at the very same moment as he discovers the true nature of God, right? Later he says, I could more easily doubt that I myself existed than that you existed. You know, the, the, the experience was so powerful. Or as Cardinal Newman put it, discussing his 14-year-old conversion, two and two only self-evident realities, God and my soul. So this is a kind of a classic conversion situation in the Western world. I'm not sure about the Eastern world, which you know so well, but Westerners find God and they find themselves in one of the same stroke. Yeah, so, you know, again, I don't know the early church fathers very well, but is there such a supple discussion of um, the relationship between God and self and, and other church fathers? Anything jump to mind? Uh, no. I basically would say no. Um, you've... you've no, it's quite difficult. There is a genuine turn to the subject, an interior turn in Augustine that, that we don't find before that. Well, I was going to say we talked about, we started this conversation by asking what's the significance of Augustine. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to make too broad a statement, but it seems like there's a very important, almost literary mm -hmm. significance here, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. uh, he's he has this very strong voice mm -hmm personal voice mm -hmm. and he turns it on himself that's right and this is a rather unusual mm -hmm. situation you know i think that in something like the platonic dialogues you see interesting um probings of what it means to be um you know searching human mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. in very personal terms mm -hmm. but they're always in this dialogue form mm -hmm. uh but here we just have Augustine kind of talking to himself or mm -hmm. talking to God, which yes. is a very different situation. Yes, I mean, Socrates talks a lot about himself, but he doesn't indulge in autobiography, properly speaking. I mean, the Confessions are perhaps the first autobiography. I mean, you have many autobiographies in previous writers, like where they discuss their philosophical path and how they, they moved through different phases and now they found the, the right path. St. Justin, you know, the first, mm. one of the first fathers talks like that but it's it's um, it's very summary you know, the idea of making your own life the object of such intense recollection and scrutiny and assessment and being fascinated by your own life this is something that I think begins with Boston well, and I was I was thinking about this just the uh, the roots of the the genre of autobiography, and I went back and was looking at Caesar's, you know... Yes, battle reports, yes. Yeah, from Gaul. Mm. And sometimes these are identified as early autobiography. But, but, maybe on some very technical definition, we could say that these are the same sort of thing as Augustine's Confessions. But not, the heart is not there. You know, it's really not the same thing at all. Um, on the one hand, it's Caesar's writings are basically propaganda for himself. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's not really about um, his subjective experience. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about his exploits, That's right. his great deeds. That's right. In many ways, he's, he's really writing history. Mm -hmm. 
It's just, it's not autobiography. There's no, right. there's no self-reflection. He's recording these great deeds that he doesn't want to be. And he writes in the third person. Right. And sometimes the things we hear about Caesar from others are more enlightening about his character than what he says about himself. You know. Um, so literarily, this, the literary significance of this 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 classic. Um, I mean, of all the writings of the Church Fathers, it is obviously by far the best known, the most widely read, the most influential. Um, but just as literature, what what is new about it? Um, as a reader, you know, Augustine is a master of rhetoric. As a reader, he would have... Reader, you're saying like a, 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 retro, a rhetorician. A rhetorician, yes. He would have known how to um, how to argue in public, in, like Cicero in the court or in the Senate. Um, but he, the idea of, of addressing a rhetorical speech to God, to begin with, right? Um, he, there's a kind of a pre-play of the Confessions in the early work called Soliloquies, where he's on his own, and it's a kind of a dialogue, but He's really addressing God, and he says, "No for him may, no for him take. May I know thee? May I know myself?" Um, the idea of making this the topic of the masterpiece of rhetoric is is unusual, and um, uh, as, a, as a literary, I'm just just trying to think of it as a literary performance. Um, it's it's unique, isn't it? It's unique. the time, yeah. Yes. Well, I was thinking. I don't know Cicero that well, but it's almost like, what if Cicero had written a letter to God, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's totally outside of his mm -hmm. his world of experience. But mm -hmm. um, you you might get something more uh, similar similar to this. It might be better to look in something like Cicero's letters for a rhetorical precedent than something like. Um, you know Caesar's biographies, or uh, even even these kind of capsule biographies you were mentioning in, in like Saint Justin. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, the actual genre of autobiography itself, it, it's not easy to find many many autobiographies after Augustine. I know there's a German who wrote a history of autobiography, Adolf Misch, M I S C H, hundreds of years ago. But when you think of autobiographers, who do you think of? Who leaps to mind? Um, well, I, not not that many people, at least in in antiquity. Mm -hmm. um, but since Augustine's time. Since Augustine's time. Well, you're the literary guy, so you'd be better well, off than me. They, they, I, I read. I grew up reading uh, Grant's Grant's autobiography, U.S. Grant. Uh, but I don't think that's quite on the same level. Now, U.S. Grant was general, right? No? And and U.S. president, yeah. Uh, president. He doesn't mm. reach quite the levels of introspection that mm. Augustine does. Well, I think of two people, both of whom are French. One is Montaigne, wrote essays, but the essays are very autobiographical. We learn an awful lot about the man himself and what his, what his mental world looked like. And then what about Pascal? Well, I wouldn't call, call him autobiographical. Uh, because he, he my, well, it was a disciple of Augustine, but he regarded the self as not worthy of attention. I mean, of course, he does analyze human existence, but he doesn't tell his life story, as far as I know, at any point. Le moi est toujours haïssable, he said, the I, the ego, is always hateful, detestable, right? And he thought Montaigne was full of himself. Rousseau, of course, is the great uh, autobiography of the Confessions, uh, and he's the opposite of Augustine. He's not beating his breast humbly before God. On the contrary, he's saying, on the last day when the trumpets of judgment sounds, I will hold up this book and I'll say, here I am, transparent. <laughs> um, but it, 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 for, for people in old societies, it took an awful lot of impertinence to write a book about themselves, you know. Um, That's a good point, yeah. My life, my life. How many people have written even humble 
product of, of their, their life. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of shocking to the um, contemporary sensibility because so much of contemporary culture is about kind of this self-confessional, therapeutic, yeah, yeah. autobiographical, writing your own story. These are terms that we come up with. Yes. Uh, these are just part of our mental toolbox now. That's right. That's right. Yes. You know, um, there's a lot of discussion about the structure of the confessions because after eight, eight books, nine books of autobiography, Augustine suddenly t starts talking about general topics for, for four, 10, 11, 12, 13, four more books. It's a commentary on Genesis, right? Yes, it ends up as a commentary on Genesis. What is going on? But perhaps Augustine is kind of saying, I've taken up too much of the stage with myself. Now I'm going to broaden the horizon and I put myself in perspective. And you won't go away thinking this book is all about Augustine when it's actually praising God for his great work in creating the world and so on. Well, there would be something uh, fitting in that because I think in every individual chapter you see a similar structure, actually. So there's something metonymic mm -hmm. about this where mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of anchor is some sort of episode from Augustine's life. Mm -hmm. But he uses that as a foundation to build up to a less personal discussion. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but it's, the word you're looking for is not metonymic, but I'm trying to find what it is. There's a rhetorical expression it begins with S. Sy synec synecdoche. Synecdoche. Yes, synecdoche. yes, you're right. Absolutely, yes. We can edit this later. No, no, no. It's very I, always, I always said synecdoche. We have now shown the, 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 the hopefully many viewers that, uh, that we have mastered the art of rhetoric, <laughs> which was actually an extremely complex art. You know, I've seen books on rhetoric uh, written by a, a German called Lausberg and an Italian called Oscolati or Oscolato, Oscolati, which go into all the subdivisions of all the possible figures of speech and so on and so forth. It's, it was a science. You know? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it, it was it was good good money, right? Mm -hmm. All the all the the. the Sons of a good family would, you know, want to practice their rhetorical skills, and this is how you made your way in the world, right? As a mm -hmm. upper class Greco Roman person. That's right. But Augustine became a preacher, and his early works, before he was ordained a priest, are rather stilted in, in their style. You can see that he's very much writing in the, foot, in the, in the, in, in the footsteps of Cicero. And he's writing elegant sentences. But in his later books, he, he's, he's simplified things very much. He's coming down to the people's level. You know? In The City of God, which is his monumental work, he does try to raise the tone a little bit because he's, he's talking about the Roman Empire. You know? But even as that goes on, it becomes Christian preaching, biblical preaching. You know? His long chapters are just a, are just a resume of, of parts of the Bible. Mm. So in a sense, he... he he prevented Christian Latin from becoming an esoteric language. He kept it close to the people. Um, well, so, I mean, did he have a, his, the style of the Confessions, did this have a great influence on, on the you know, non... Um, Non-Christian world? Yeah. Mm. Well, there wasn't a non-Christian world. We don't have a lot time, of, we don't have yes. a lot of material yes. post-Augustine there, does it? I mean, their fifth, sixth centuries. There's not a lot of non non ecclesiastical material, right? Probably not. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm not quite sure about that. I mean, Petrarch, for example, Petrarch was the first great Renaissance Latin writer, would be very influenced by Augustine's style, I think. Well, I do um, notice if you look mm -hmm. in a if you look in a Latin dictionary, mm -hmm. a lot of times. Uh, Augustine is the um, the authority for many uh, def definitions of, of later, uh, later later definitions of Latin words. Ah, that's interesting. He mm -hmm. seems to be the can canonical, post classical yeah. Latin writer. I see. I see. Interesting. Right. Okay. So the significance of this literary, theological, philosophical work, and um, in a way, you'd have to be. I mean. 
you'd have to be approaching it on all three fronts simultaneously, literature, theology, and philosophy. And some, some books on Augustine approach it on another front, philology, with no perspective, either literarily, theologically, or philosophically. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's shocking, given that, com the complexity of the work, it's, it's somewhat shocking to me that uh, it's as well-read as it is today. You know, if you, um, if you, if you get a list of great works or a, a reading list in many schools, at least in the U.S., this book will be on there. Mm -hmm. So right. it has a readership, probably mm -hmm. one of the few um, works of antiquity that mm -hmm. any educated person reads, mm -hmm. other than the Bible and maybe mm -hmm. Plato, mm -hmm. at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, the, the caveat is that it's, it's still not a lot of people, but well, you definitely see, many more, many more than you would expect. But the main storyline is so gripping. I mean, it is a page turner at least up to, up to chapter nine or so, because things are happening and there is a kind of puzzle to be solved. Right. So should we go over what that, what the plot is, if we can say there's a plot, those first nine books? So we start out and Augustine is, he's a, a sounds like he's the son of a kind of mid-level bureaucrat, basically, in okay. provincial mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So this is not the center of the Roman world by any no. stretch of the imagination. But he, he makes a journey, and you know, in the background of that is the Odyssey, or more particularly the Aeneid of, of Virgil. Augustine is on a quest. He's making a voyage. He travels to Milan. He travels to Rome. He travels back to Carthage. To, to Carthage, and his mother is following him as is Terra Mariquin the seconds, following me by sea and land. You know, uh, she's like Dido, following Aeneas, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And she's the main character in the story. You know, she weeps over him, and she goes to the, the priest and says, my son has gone off the beaten track, he's gone astray. And the priest or bishop says to her, a son of such tears cannot perish. <laughs> so it, it's an odyssey, and he's in peril, he's losing his way. And he finds his way back. And the idea of Reditus return to the homeland, you know, like Odysseus returning to, to um, Ithaca. Yeah. Or Augustine coming to Rome and landing on Italian soil and founding his Roman Empire, his future Roman Empire. Um, that, that's haunting Augustine's imagination. He's seeing his own life as a quest, as a successful quest, not thanks to himself, Duce te, led by you, led by God, as he says at the key point. Um, and so the story is one of losing your way, of alienation, right? He's alienated, right? As a child, of course, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's, he's a very annoying baby. Or he imagines oh, he's oh, an annoying baby. Bowling and annoying his parents. And, so. yeah. and well, then we should come back to that, because it's a discussion of the mm -hmm. sin of infants is a but that's very right. interesting, that's rather right. disturbing, actually. But we'll leave that aside for now. And then in book two, he steals the fairies. And this, of course, is a horrible sin. He's becoming evil and wicked. He's already straying far from God. And then in, in book three, he goes to Carthage, a city of unholy lusts. He's, he's really sunk. And then book four, there's a beautiful discussion of friendship, the friend who dies and the grief that he feels. And um, in a sense, this brings him back to being more human. It, or it, it, it reminds him the values that count are the values of the heart. You know? Well, it's interesting because uh, he is he's raised a Christian, yes, in the sense of uh, from from yes. childhood. His mother, his mother is a believing, baptized Christian. Yes, but it's strange to me, and I never really understood why, that even though he's raised a Christian by his mother, he doesn't really seem to be that versed, that conversant with the, with the Christian church. I mean, the things that Ambrose teaches him, you would have thought he would have known as a child. So I'm not quite sure what life was like in those African Christian families back then. You know? Right. His father 
comes across as not very Christian at all. Well, the father's yeah. not. He's not a Christian. I don't no, think. He's not actually a Christian. Not even baptized. Yeah. Yeah. One gets the sense that maybe people didn't really have a full grasp of what what this religion was exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. I imagine I reading um, in book two and three where he talks about his upbringing. I keep imagining the father coming home one day and finding his wife with like a. Uh, you know, the Jeho she's let the Jehovah's Witness into the door or something like that, it's kind of transmuting the modern situation. And mm -hmm. they're discussing like the mm -hmm. Bible and, mm -hmm. and religion. And he has mm -hmm. no idea what's going on. He mm -hmm. just says, whatever you want to do, honey, you know, I <laughs> just see, leave see. me out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then you, I, 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 I wonder what the infrastructure then would have been, right? Mm -hmm. um, are there churches people can attend and um, any sort of, authoritative person of authority to talk about what what the bible was and um perhaps perhaps not i mean this is pretty early in the history of the church mm -hmm. but when augustine himself comes along he starts taking extreme care of catechesis he has the the, the text on um, the cate the catechism is really was on, on on educating the beginners so maybe he was aware that something was lacking in the, in the, in the running of the church, that it wasn't given right. proper catechesis. One of the points I found interesting, just as a matter of religious history, is uh, despite the general ignorance of, of doctrinal matters, mm -hmm. everybody in Augustine's orbit in, in his early days mm -hmm. seems very aware of the power of baptism. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. have to wonder whether there's a sort of general feeling that this is a, a ritual with kind of a magical almost mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested uh, to read that, so Augustine wasn't baptized as a child. Mm -hmm. um, his, I think his mother was baptized in mm -hmm. midlife, mm -hmm. but um, he, he discusses explicitly, I think in book two, mm -hmm. he talks about how his mother held off on having him baptized mm -hmm. um, because she's worried that he may be baptized and then implied is that this will lead to a state of tremendous kind of grace and uh, absolve you of sin. Mm -hmm. But if he's not very firm in his convictions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he'll go from that state straight back to his, mm -hmm. his bad old ways and, mm -hmm. and uh, fall back into the world and kind of undo all the good mm -hmm. that you get from baptism. And the other um, assumption there is that, you can really only really be baptized once, right? So there's no other system for really cleansing yourself. This is a fascinating point you're making there. You know, if you read the Epistle to the Hebrews, he talks about those who have tasted the heavenly gift and then cast it aside can never be, you know, put right. And then you have the church's discipline of penance, which began in the second century, but began sort of um, sporadically and probably wasn't, you know, when the Irish monks came along and invented auricular confession, you just told your sins and then you're back on the track again. Um, things were more reassuring. But I think the early Christians did feel that baptism was a stupendous, life-changing event, not to be taken lightly and certainly not to be given. Well, yes, there was infant baptism, but I'm not sure to what extent. But in any case, uh, Augustine was not baptized as an infant. Very famously, Constantine the Great waited until his deathbed to get baptized. Well, I think this is this, is, this was a common his, practice. A common practice, yes. Yeah, in late he, antiquity, he didn't want to spoil his, his lovely sanctifying grace by putting it to the test of real life um, situations. So then, to pick up the thread of Augustine's life, though, so um, he continues on to Carthage, and in Carthage, he really falls in with the Manichaeans. Yes, I'm not sure at what point the Manichaeans enter the story. They dominate it in book five. I mean, he's, he's, he's totally immersed in their world. And then in book six, the Catholic Church begins, begins to reappear in a more sympathetic guise, thanks to St. Ambrose. And then in book seven, he's wrestling with this Manichaean mindset and his attempt to understand the Christian God in a different way from the Manichaeans have led him to misunderstand God, but he doesn't know positively how he should. And that's where Plotinus plays that key role. And it's amazing to me that 
without Plotinus, our whole Christian idea of God would be different because Augustine's idea of God comes from Plotinus and he is the one who is most impressed, at least on the Latin West, the notion of God, what God is like. I mean, um, so for and the, the main difference, to be clear, is the Manichaeans think of everything in material terms. Yes. That's so right. uh, good, good and evil are something... Um, yeah, physically. They're, they're like atoms or something yes, that yes. you want to expunge the, the evil ones mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. preserve the good ones. Right. It's an interesting thing that it's, it's, a, it's quite materialistic. Good, evil can be rooted out. It can be found in either plants or trees and rooted out. Uh, in a sense, it's a kind of a, a raw, primitive religiosity. And in a sense, Augustine never got away from that, even when it comes to things spiritually. The way he talks about sin and grace all his life has a tremendous concreteness. But you wonder sometimes, is it a sort of instinctive, Primitive concreteness. I mean, I that he, not say this. I shouldn't say this. <laughs> that he has left over from his uh, he was his he Manich was, Manichaean he, days. He was accused by the Pelagians and especially by this Julian of Eclanum, uh, an allegedly Pelagian bishop. Augustine went down fighting him, but he was accused. Augustine was accused of being a crypto Manichaean. And I wouldn't say that Augustine won the argument entirely, you know, but who can know that? Um, an acquaintance of mine, Matthew Lamberates in Blue Vein, wrote a four volume study, a vast study, four 600 page volumes on Julian's quarrel with Augustine. Unfortunately, he wrote it in Dutch, so the riddle remains uh, ah, unsolved. Where will we ever find? You'll have to go Someone to the library. To to the li it's not even published. You'll have to go to the library in Louvain and consult it. I think we can have a break here. Okay.